All right, so here we are. It's been almost two full years. And God has blessed us tremendously. You know, obviously the, this church, it started almost two years ago. And it's been a very slow growth. But we're still, we're still moving forward. We're not moving. We've never moved backward. We're still going forward. But, um, you know, I want to I start off just by saying, you know, all great things, all good things, they're going to start small. They're going to start real small. You think of the, the great oak trees that you might see, real strong wood, strong trees that are out there. And they're, you know, and they're real tall and mighty. And you look like nothing's going to knock that down. Nothing's going to uproot that tree. Well, it didn't get that way overnight. Every big, strong tree that you see started from one small seed. It all starts with that new birth, with that new life, with that real small, fragile, slow growth. Just year after year, it grows and bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, everyone, no one wants to look at the little baby trees, right? Everyone, you know, all the, all the, the sight and the, you know, the, the magnificence and the marvelousness that goes to the, the big ones. You know, man, this has been here for a super long time. Look at how big and strong and powerful this tree is. And that's great. But everything comes in its due time. You know, those big trees start small. Our church, of course, it's starting small. But we're doing it the right way. We're not compromising on anything that we believe. If we wanted to just... And here's the thing. You know, I'm super excited, as I know all of you are, that we are to this point now where we're no longer meeting in a small room in my house, but now we've, we've moved into a building, a bigger place. And look, it's not about the building. I don't think anybody here really cares. You know, we could just have some great building. Look, we could have got something twice this size or three times this size. It doesn't matter if, you know, especially if we still have a really, really small group of people. Who cares about the building? It doesn't matter. The building means nothing except that it's, it's a path that we're on to fill up with more people. You know, Jesus Christ said, you know, go out and compel them to come into my house. And this is the focus that I want to have this morning. Where I'm going to be preaching to you this morning on taking Word of Truth Baptist Church to the next level. We're, we're, we're in a growth. You know, we don't want to have stunted growth and just be stuck at an, at an infancy stage for our entire existence. That would be sad. That's not right. We need to continue to grow. But here's the deal. We are a body. We are a congregation. The church is not the pastor. The church is not just you individually. The church is all of us. It's the entire congregation. We all make up this church. And in order for us to grow as a church, we all have to grow individually. We all have to grow together. We have to be coming together in the unity of the faith, but also doing the things in our own lives to continue to grow, to continue to reach people. If we really want to see this church be a great success, and by success I mean the point where we're reaching the maximum number of people that we could reach in this community, where we could bring people together, bring people into this church, and see lives get changed, see souls get saved, and see people serving God with their life. If we want to achieve the maximum about that, hey, we all need to participate. We all need to get together and get involved in the work. One person doing the work can only achieve so much, but when we all get together and we're all growing, hey, God's going to bless that. He's going to bless that even more. I started off, we started off reading in Ephesians chapter 1 because this is one of the, the main verses. There's, there's a few places in the Bible that use the word word of truth in Scripture. And a lot of thought and a lot of time and, and, and just, just thinking in, in about what the name of the church should be before we started this church was put into that. And this is one of the verses that we actually have on our invitations as we go out. It's Ephesians 1, verse number 13. It says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. There's a lot of things I like about this verse. You know, one of the most obvious things is that it gives you that, that concept of your eternal salvation, eternal security. You are secure. When you got saved, when you believed on Jesus Christ, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. When you put your faith in Christ, He has sealed you. You are His. He put that earnest, just like the earnest money on a house, He put that earnest of the Spirit into your heart. You belong to God now. You're His. 
But not just that, where did that come from? Where did that seed come from? It came because they, hear, they heard the word of truth. Without hearing the word of truth, without hearing God's word, the Holy Bible, His message and His words, it's impossible for people to get saved. We need that word of truth. And that is what this church is all about, is providing the word of truth. God's holy, unadulterated word. Look, we're all adults here, except for you know, a few of the children. I guess we're not all adults here. We have some children in the room, but we can handle it. No matter whether you're a child, whether you're an adult, you know, this church is supposed to be a group of people that love the truth. We want to know the truth. We want to hear the truth. Look, sometimes the truth is amazing. And it's beautiful and it's great and, it, and it's comforting. And you think, wow, God is so merciful and God is so long-suffering. Even though I continue to screw up in my life, I know he still loves me. I know he's there for me. And even when I make some really, really, really poor decisions, he's still there waiting for me to come back to him. And that is great news and that is very comforting. And, and, and I love hearing that truth. But you know what? Sometimes the truth isn't always that pleasant. The part where, you know, it's saying you're not doing what's right. You're sinning. You're, you, know, you shouldn't be doing the things that you're doing. You're, do, you're, you are working contrary to the Lord. You know, for example, when Jesus Christ says, you know, he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. What's he saying? If you are not actively trying to gather people and get people to serve Christ and get people saved, he says you're actually scattering. You say, well, I'm not doing anything wrong. Well, no, if you're not doing good, the Bible says, He that knoweth to do, to do right and doeth it not, to him it is sin. These are the things that, it may not be as pleasant to hear that. You might feel like, oh, oh man, that stings. Why did I come here for? That doesn't feel good. I don't, you know. But look, it's needful. And hopefully, you know, we're a group of people, and I, know, I believe that we are. I know right now I could speak for probably just about everybody in this room, that the group of people in this room love God and want to do, or we're interested in knowing the truth. Good, bad, ugly, whatever it is, whether it's comforting, whether it's convicting, we want to know what's right because we want to do what's right by God and we know ultimately God knows what's best for us. So the things that we're doing where we fall short, where we're failing, well look, we know that if we change those things, it's only going to be better for us in the end anyways. So we want to know, hey God, what am I doing that's wrong? Where am I in sin? Where are the things that, that, that I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing, Lord? I want to know what they are because I want to be blessed by you. I want to know what it is that you have for me to do in my life where I'm not falling short. These are the types of things that we want to know. But you can only get that from God's Word. And in this church, you're going to be hearing it from someone who's going to preach all of the Bible, everything that's found in the book. Now, just as the oak tree, right now we may, be, we may be small, we may be a small number, but I believe we have a very solid core of people who love God, we're in it for the long haul, we're not going to be, you know, the uh, uh, flash in the pan type of a Christian where, oh man, I'm going to go out and serve God and do all this great work and then the next day, you know, the next week you're not even in church, right? No, we know that this is a lifelong thing. Being a Christian, serving God is something that you dedicate your whole life to doing. It's not just a one-week thing or a one-month thing or one-year thing. This is something that you need to invest your life into. It's that important. I mean, what is your life? The Bible says it's just a vapor. You know, you're here today, gone tomorrow. That's our, your life span goes by in the blink of an eye. When all things are said and done, when you look back on your life, it's going to be vanity and you will have no fulfillment whatsoever if you could look back at your life and be like, you did nothing for God. We need to take our time and make sure that we're doing the best to serve Him and, to, and by serving Him, we're also serving others. So we may be starting off slow, but we're solid. How are we going to continue to grow? And we're going to go through some points here. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation, Revelations chapter 2 and 3 are great chapters about, because they're, they're chapters that contain letters written to individual churches. There's seven churches at the time that, that John was receiving this word from God. He's writing these letters unto these churches. 
And we can see a lot of good things they were doing and a lot of bad things that they were doing. And these are applicable. The reason why they're in the Bible today is because they're still applicable for churches today. We can look at these things and see, wow, what were these people doing? Here's what God liked. God loved that they're doing these works. God loved that they're remaining steadfast. God loves that they're resisting the devil. God loves that these different things. But then God also hates certain other things. And he's warning them and saying, look, churches... As a church, if you don't get your act together, he says, I'm going to remove your candlestick out of its place. And this, is a ser this, this applies to every church that's been in existence since from this time and you know, henceforth. Because God will look at a church and he'll say, if you aren't doing what I want you to do, if you're not serving me the, the way that I said to, he says, I won't even recognize you as a church. And you're going to go downhill. And churches come and they go. And they become great. And oftentimes, just like empires of, of this nation, just worldly speaking, you know, empires come and they go. They reach this, this maximum power and then they get corrupt. And then there's, you know, there's all kinds of, of wickedness and sin usually comes into it. And then God judges them and destroys them. All throughout history, that's been the, been the way things go. But it's also been that way with churches. You know, they, they rise up, they start up small, and... They reach this point of greatness, but then they tend to forget God. They tend to forget their humble beginnings and start to get covetous and proud and having these attributes that, uh, that, that don't belong in church, that don't belong in serving God. And usually that will bring the demise of a church. But we need to take some, you know, look at this and maintain the right focus all throughout. It's a little bit easier to stay humble when, we're, when you're small, when you're still growing. It is easier, definitely. But we need to make sure we keep the right focus. And what I want to focus on this morning is on Revelation 3, uh, verse number 15. The Bible says, well, look at verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. This is the Laodicean church. Right. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eyes have that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Here we see a church in Laodicea that they thought everything was just fine. They said, God says, you're not, you're not cold or hot. So you guys are just coasting. You just got it on autopilot. You're just, you're just going through life thinking, wow, God's really blessed me. I have all these riches. Everything's just going great for me. And you're just playing it easy. You're just getting along and everything seems to be going great because your finances are going great and you think you're so rich. But he says, you're not cold or hot. You're not even cold. You're just lukewarm. And he's saying, I hate that. Living the Christian life you know, if you just want to live your life without having any problems, without having any people, you know, you know any, any negative interactions with somebody or, or not getting any type of persecution for your beliefs and you just want to go through life and not say anything about God, just be like, well, I'm saved and things seem to be going well for me financially and, and just start to get this feeling I'm rich. God hates that. That's why, you know, as I, I mentioned that verse earlier, Jesus said, you know, he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. That's exactly who the lukewarm Christian is. Someone, you're not going out and doing any work. You're not doing anything for God. You're just doing nothing. And you think, you have the mindset of thinking, well, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not going out, I mean, I'm not going out and committing adultery. I'm not going out and getting drunk. I'm not going out and doing these wicked things that so many other people are doing. So I can't be doing that bad. And God's saying, I want to spit you out of my mouth. I want to spew you out of my mouth. You are just lukewarm. Look, either get in or get out is the attitude that he's taking here. Look, if you're going to serve me, get in and get in all the way. 
Start serving me. Start doing something. Get active. Yes, it may cause some, some trouble in your life from, from other people who, who, want, who don't agree with what you believe. Yeah, you may face some other problems, some persecutions at work, at home, wherever. And especially at home, this is something that, that drives a lot of people to just shut their mouth. The family members, they don't want to hear it. And then you say, well, I don't want to cause a problem with my family. But Jesus Christ said, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. There are things, you know, God's word needs to be spoken. It needs to be said. It needs to be talked about. You know, we have a society that wants to tell you, oh, it's taboo. Don't talk about religion. Religion and politics, don't talk about them. Don't bring it up because we just want to get along with everybody. As if that is the point of life. From the world, is going to tell you, well, just getting along with everybody, that's just the whole point of life. That's what it's all about. And then one day you're going to die and, hey, great, you got along with everybody. Congratulations. And you did absolutely nothing for those people. Nothing. If you truly want to help people out, you're not going to lie to them. It was a great analogy is, you know, someone's, someone's got their house on fire and you just want to be warm and friendly. And, hey, how you doing, neighbor? Everything's going great. Okay, good. Well, I'm going to go to bed now. You take care. Have a, have a great night. They're not going to give you any problems, but you didn't do anything to help them from their house that's burning down and they're going to get, you know, they're going to die in the fire. There's a lot of warnings in the Bible. And I'm going to be preaching a sermon on those coming up soon. There's a lot of warnings that God has given us. A lot of things that we need to look out for. A lot of truth in these words that say, look, avoid this. Don't, you know, flee fornication. Avoid it. Avoid, avoid uh, false doctrines. Avoid the Pharisees. Avoid, avoid all these different things because it's going to ruin you. It's going to, it's going to destroy you. These things are going to get in and they're going to ruin your life. And there's a lot of warnings that we need to be able to there to warn, you know, as in uh, our Bible memory verse from, from last week, the very first verse, warn the unruly. That's something that we need to do. There's warnings in the Bible. Hey, we need to take these warnings and pass it on to people. You know, warn the unruly, those people who don't want to have God's rule over them. O obey just, just basic principles in the Bible. They're unruly. They don't care about it. They want to have nothing to do with it. They need to be warned. If you don't say anything, they're going to continue on doing what they're doing. Somebody needs to speak up and speak against a lot of things that are going on in this world in order for people just to hear and say, oh, wow, I didn't even think about that. Because there's a lot of people out there that just, you know, they want to know what's right too. I run into them sometimes out solely. People just say, well, yeah, they're, they've got the same, a similar mindset. I want to know what's right. But no one, they've never heard it. People have never heard the gospel before. They're just sitting there waiting to get saved, but they've never even heard it before. But how is that person going to get saved if you don't open up your mouth and preach boldly, boldly the gospel of God? You can't just say, oh, well, the pastor, he's, he's going to go out and do that. That's his job. I'm only one person. I don't have the map in here yet. I'm going to put it up on the wall. But I'll show you how long it takes for one person to just do some of this, especially some of the streets out here, they're really long. One person is not going to cover this whole city. No way. It's not going to happen. That's why we need the church. Everybody. It's, it's, you know, God has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation. It's our job. Our job as a whole. Not just one person. It's not any one person's job. It's all of our jobs to go out and preach the gospel. God wants us to be on fire. He doesn't want us just saying, okay, I checked it off, I came to church, that's done, that's out of the way. No. Get on fire for serving God. Don't compromise. Have the, maintain that love of the truth. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. So we're going to focus on our growth. We want to take Word of Truth Baptist Church to the next level. We don't want to have this mindset of thinking, oh, great, we've got this beautiful building. We've arrived. Here we are. I'm just going to take it easy now. We're going to relax because we've got these nice chairs and this nice piano and this nice carpeting and this nice paint on the wall. That's not what it's about, folks. <laughs> Look, is it nice? Hey, praise the Lord that he's blessed us to meet in a nice location. Praise God for that. I'm happy for that. There's nothing wrong with being happy about that. But that is not 
what this church is about. And that is not the you know, a, a reason to just say, cool, we're here, we'll take it easy now. No, we need to keep moving forward. And actually, I'm using this. This has got me excited. It's exciting news. You know, it's a nice change. It's a nice place. Let's go out and be re-inspired and reinvigorated. Go out and reach even more people. Bring them in here. Get them under the preaching of God and get some more lives changed. You're in 2 Timothy chapter 2. One of the ways that we're going to grow as a church, as I mentioned earlier, is going to start with you individually. And one of the ways that we need to do that is with your personal sanctification. Just everyone individually. You know, in order for God to use us and to bless us, we all need to be making sure that we're keeping ourselves right in God's eyes. And He's going to be leading our paths and we're not just going astray and going to the left hand and going to the right hand and doing all these other things that we want to do. We need to be doing what God... And look, I know that it's God's will that this church grows. I know that for a fact. It's not a question. It's not, I don't know, does God just want to have, you know, 20 people sitting around the room? 20 believers studying His Word? Or does God, you think God might want some more than that? You think God might want a few more people, a lot more people, coming and serving Him and getting right with Him and learning from His Word? Look, I know that that's what God wants. There's no question about it. But we need to make sure that we're doing our part. Because look, God has a role for every single one of us in this church and He wants to use you. The only one that can limit God is us. God doesn't want to be limited. God is a God of miracles. God is a God of great things. God is a God of taking someone of lowly stature and of no repute and, and, and using that person to do great things and to do wonders. He takes men like Moses, who were like the meekest man, he was the meekest man on the earth. Not someone that you would look at and say, wow, he's a great leader. No, the last person that you would think he's going to be this great leader and lead all the children of Israel out and perform all these great miracles and you know, stand up to Pharaoh and say, look, he uses people that you would never guess because that way God gets even more of the honor and God gets more of the praise and the glory because he's using someone that they don't even have the natural abilities to do it. And that's what God wants to do. So don't sit there and say, well, I'm not very good at talking to people. I'm kind of shy. Look, God will use you. It's God that's working through you and He can use you to do mighty things. Don't let your own physical incapabilities or whatever, whatever, your perceived incapabilities keep you from serving God and from doing what's right. He will use you. But in order for Him to use you, we need to make sure that we're a vessel that's meat for the Master's use, that we're ready to use. And wherever you're at, whatever stage you're at, look, God wants you to come to Him and start doing what's right. And even if you've never been sowing before, look, you can get people saved. And He will use you to do that. But I'll tell you what, the more you can get clean up, the more you can practice, the more you go out and do it, the more He's going to be able to use you. And the more you're going to be able to do for God. You're in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse number 19. Verse number 19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. God wants us to depart from this. Stop sinning. Look, get the sin out of your life. Let everyone, that you name the name of Christ. Are you here this morning? You say, yes, Jesus Christ is my Savior. My faith is in Jesus Christ to save me. Depart from iniquity. We need to get that out. Look, get away from it. Get it out of your life. Verse 20, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. What a shame that would be for, for it to be said of you that, oh yeah, you're a dishonor unto God. So hey, in a great house there's a lot of people a, and, and there are a lot of people that are saved. Now overall, there are a few that are saved in, in the whole grand scheme of things. But just in general, there's, I mean, you can say millions of people are, you know, whatever, whatever the number is, it may be few in the total population, but there's still a lot of people. It's still a great house. Some vessels unto honor, some unto dishonor. In, in, in a large family, you may have some kids that are really good kids, some kids that aren't so good. 
right? And they could kind of bring dishonor upon your family when they, when they go out and do, do rotten things, right? But it doesn't mean they're no longer a child, right? Obviously, when, when you're born again and you're saved, you become a child of God, hey, you're a child. But in a great house, you know what? There's some vessels under honor and there's some vessels under dishonor. We want to make sure that we are vessels under honor, that we are bringing honor unto God, not dishonor. Look at verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. We start purging out the sin from our life. We start doing what's right. We start actually listening to God and say, wow, okay, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. I'm going to change what I'm doing because it's, because it's what God told me not to do. Then you will be meet means you'll be ready for the master's use. He will be prepared. You, are be, you will be prepared and he'll be ready to use you. And he'll be able to start sending you out to do even more for him. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. Just a few pages back. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First and 2 Thessalonians come right before 1 and 2 Timothy in your Bibles. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. Verse number 1. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse number 1 reads, Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Look, he's saying, you've heard the commandments. We preach it to you. you. You've heard God's word. You know that these things are wrong. He says, this is the will of God, your sanctification, getting that sin out of your life, getting away from that stuff, being sanctified so that you can possess your vessel, the body that you are carrying in sanctification and honor with respect, with integrity unto God. Say, you know what? I'm a Christian and I'm going to keep my body as pure as possible so I'm going to get rid of all the sin, this fornication, the drugs, the alcohol, whatever the case may be, it's, it's out of my life. Because I want God to look down on me and be proud of me that I'm, that I'm someone who's actually can be looked on as someone who's not just um, a, a vessel unto dishonor and dishonoring unto Christ who I name as my Savior. Let's keep reading here, verse 5. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we also have forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. In order for us to grow, look, individually, we need to be keeping ourselves meat for the master's use. We need to be keeping ourselves free from a life of sin. I mean, obviously, I know that we're all going to be sinners, and I know that nobody's perfect, but don't let that become your excuse when you do sin. Well, nobody's perfect. Well, it's okay because I'm just human anyways, and just, and just have this permissive attitude of just saying, well, okay, I did wrong, and just kind of be flippant about it. Whatever, no big deal, I'm a sinner, okay. Instead of having a, a, a proper sorrow. The Bible says, godly sorrow worketh repentance. We need to be sorry when we do things that are wrong, and, and it ought to grieve you. You ought to be sad about it and say, man, I'm bringing dishonor unto Christ when I go out and do these things. That's not honorable. Oh, I need to change that. As opposed to the attitude that's just like, eh, well, okay. I mean, you think about, uh, my favorite analogy in the Bible is, is one of being a child to the Father. That is my, my ultimate favorite just thought and concept of the Bible, that we're His children. And as a father, it really helps me to understand God's Word so much more. And when you have children, and you tell them to do things, and you, you expect them to obey you, just as God does for us. He expects us to obey. He doesn't just write this stuff in here and say, oh yeah, well, that's what the Bible says. But, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and do whatever because, I mean, whatever. Everybody's doing this. It's not that big of a deal. 
It's really not that big. I mean, come on, it's not that big of a deal. It's what God said. He doesn't say things for nothing. Just to hear himself speak. Just to have it written down, you know, and preserved throughout all ages for no reason is because eh, it's not really that big of a deal. And when I speak to my children, what do you think might happen if they have this total disregard for my, well, I know that's what dad, you know, I hear them talking, yeah, I know that's what dad said, but come on, let's just go do this anyways. There's going to be a little discipline involved. Little, a little red butt cheeks running around if I hear that type of attitude. And rightfully so. And look, God feels the same way. When you know what his word says and you just go off and, and do whatever it is that, that you want to do anyways and just, just disregard and have no respect unto his word, he's going to bring the discipline. He's going to bring that punishment in our lives. And there are many, look, there are many ways that God can make that happen. Many ways. You don't even always realize it, but usually then looking back, you're like, wow, I was pretty stupid. You know, because be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And when you start sowing to the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind, my friend. But we need to keep ourselves in that sanctification. Look, instead of being chastised and disciplined by God, Let's get blessed by God. Let's get rid of those. Let's listen to what he has to say and start doing them, getting the sin out of our life. And that is going to help us to grow. One other thing that's going to help us to grow, my last point is going to be having a love for others. That is a driving factor in our life, in our existence. Is, you know, the, the two great commandments are love God, right? And love other people. Those, those are the two great things we need to do and keep that focus. Obviously, we need to love God first, but in loving God, hey, God wants us to go out and be, you know, the, the titles that are used in ministry, it's your know, minister, servant, right? These types of things, it's, it's helping other people, putting other people above your own needs, looking at someone else and say, wow, how can I help this person? And having this type of an attitude and not being so concerned about your own self but worrying about, hey, how can I be a blessing to them? How can I help them to succeed? Here's someone that may be struggling in an area of their life. How can I help that person? And looking out for each other and looking out for others as well and going out and witnessing Christ. Let's keep reading here in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, look at verse number 9. The Bible reads, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. So he's saying, look, you're doing a good job. You don't need for me to tell you that you need to love your brethren. You already know that. You already know it. And, and look, and indeed you do it. And I could say that this morning. You know that we need to be loving our brothers in Christ. You know that we need to be helping them out. And you're doing it. But let's keep reading this verse. He says, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. Don't become complacent and say, yeah, well, I, I do help people. Look, let's do more and more. Let's serve God. Hey, this is a great step where we are right now, but I'm not happy with just staying here. I want to be out of here in a year. That's the least we sign, in one year. No, is that going to happen? I don't know. I don't know what God has planned, but we all need to get active and get activated and go out and increase more and more. Say, look, oh, I'm doing good things. Well, let's do more. Let's serve God more. We, let's, let's really push ourselves to do this thing. Say, but I do care about other people. Let's increase more and more. Let's see what more we can do. Turn, if you would, to Matthew. No, actually, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want to ask you this this morning. How many friends do you have that you could think of that are your friend as a result of something that you did for them before they even knew you, before you even be, you know, became like what you consider to be friends. And when was the last time you cared for the poor or the lame or the sick? 
if you don't have any friends that you can think of that, that you know, you did something for them and then they became, look, this happens all the time. Not, not all the time, but, but this is a way that a lot of people become friends. Someone has a need. There's something going on in their life. You step in and just, just help that person out and they, and they, they love you. They, they're real thankful for what you've done for them. And the reason why I ask the question that way is because are you gaining new friends? And look, they don't have to be your best friends in the whole world. But someone who's a friend, someone you consider, you know, hey, you're, you're, you're doing things for them. You're helping them out and you can stay in contact with them. Maybe we need to be doing a little bit more. If you can't think of anybody that, that you, out of the kindness of your own heart, have touched their life to the point to where they can at least, you know, you could, you could communicate with each other as a friend would. We need to increase more and more. Jesus was our best example in loving other people. Yea, greater love hath no man than this, and a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus laid down his life for us. Jesus spent his entire ministry serving other people. It was never about himself. Of all people that could say, man, I'm tired. Man, I just need a break. Man, I need to go on vacation. I think it would be Jesus Christ. When you read about the works and the, the, just the traveling he did, away from his family, traveling, you know, where he had to literally, to get away from people sometimes, just to like pray to God, which is something else that he needed to do. He had to just go up into a mountain. I mean, there's people all over the place and he's healing them and he's, and he's feeding them and he's doing, you know, all, all sorts of things to help them preaching to him, giving him truth, everything that they need, as much as he, as he was capable of doing in the flesh, he was doing. Praying hours, you know, praying at night. When did the guy sleep? You know, he told people, say, you know, like, I want to I be with you, I want to follow you. He's like, the foxes have dens and the birds of the air have nests, you know, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He's like, I don't even know where I'm going to sleep tonight. I don't have a place because he dedicated his time and his life so much to serving other people. It's not like, oh, well, you know, it's getting a little bit late. I'm going to go back home now and eat a nice meal and, and go to bed in my, in my nice soft bed and wake up. And I'm not saying it's a sin. I'm not saying you have to just become a vagabond and start, you know, preaching to everyone in order to be right with God. But this is the example that Jesus left for us and he is the best example of, of how much he cared for other people and what his ministry was, what he was called to do. But think about how much he was ridiculed by the, the, so, you know, the religious people, the church people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, these people that, that, that the world would look to as they are these holy, sanctified people. These, these people in these positions of power and, and, and in charge of so much. If you want to know anything about religion, yeah, go to talk to these guys. They were the ones that were despising Jesus Christ because he was going and, and eating with the sinners and the publicans and the harlots and, you know, and, and, and trying to reach them. But what did Jesus say? Look, they that be whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. He went to the people that needed it. He's like, I'm not going to go to you. you. You've got everything just set. You're just fine, right? You've got all your ducks in a row. You're lukewarm and that's the way you like it. Fine. He said, I'm going to go to the people that need help. And that's exactly what he did. And that's what we need to be doing. Reaching people. Going out. Going to them. Look, they're not going to come to you. You need to go to them. Jesus went out to heal people. He went out to seek and to save that which was lost. He had to find it. He had to look. He had to do the work. It's not coming to him. Don't expect God to just, to just drop people into your lap that are just waiting to get saved. I mean, that may happen once in a blue moon. But don't just wait for that. You need to be going out and seeking. You need to be going out and reaching people. Jesus Christ was completely selfless. And this is the attitude that we need to have. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 where I had you turn. I need to get there myself. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is the, the chapter about charity. Charity is a special type of love. It's an it's a, it's a, it's a attitude that you have, having charity towards others. And we're going to read this. I'm going to go through this, expound this chapter. It's not very long. We're going to read through this whole chapter and, and try to get this understanding of where we need to be in our life and the love that we have for other people. The charity that we have. 
Most people think of charity today and you think of an organization that you just send money to and you're giving to charity. But that's not what charity is. That's giving money. And we're going to see that in, in chapter 13 here. Let's look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. <laughs> and though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. Now, this is something a lot of people seek after, right? I mean, just understanding prophecy and mysteries and knowledge and getting And look, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a good thing. It's something that we're told to do is to increase our learning and increase our understanding and get in the Bible more. And it's something that we ought to be doing. But he's saying, look, if I have all of that and I understand every single bit of it, and though I have all faith so I could remove mountains, my faith is strong in God and I could tell this mountain to remove and it'll do it because my faith is so strong and have not charity, I am nothing. Nothing. No amount of knowledge. No amount of faith. If you have zero charity, if you have no charity, you're nothing. It means nothing. Because the charity is what's going to drive you to actually use those things to help other people. Because you care about other people. It's not about yourself. You know, the people could, you know, someone might have a lot of knowledge and they could puff themselves up and be, wow, look at me. You know, I'm going to put all these letters after my name so you guys all know how smart I really am and how many times I've read this book and, and how much I know. Is that really going to help you out for me to stand up here and just tell you how smart I am? Not at all. If anything, it's going to drive you away from, <laughs> you're like, look at this jerk. You know, just know it all. I want to hear what he has to say. But if you're using that knowledge that you do have to help other people, I'll say, look, this is what the Bible says. This, you know, we, need, we need to be following this because this is going to help you out. You need, you, know, you need to avoid this stuff. That's another thing. That's having the charity to help people out. Same thing with the faith. You, know, you, you can do these great things because you believe in God and you have this strong faith, but you have charity, you're nothing. Verse number three. This is what I was referring to about, you know, giving money to some organization. That's not charity either, just the act of doing that. Verse number three, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, all my goods, if I give everything I have to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. So wait a minute, how could you, how could you give everything and, and not have charity? A lot of people do it. Look at, look at the, the Bill Gates and these, you know, these, these rich people who give a lot of money to organizations, right? Why do they do that? You think it's because they care? That's exactly right. They want people to pat them. They're, they're patting themselves on the back. They want the accolades. They want people to say, oh, what a great guy. Look at it. Because do they ever just donate money and not say anything about it? Does, do any of these people just... They care about an issue and, you know, they're real wealthy and say, you know what, I'm just going gonna, gonna to anonymously donate a million dollars to this organization because I believe in what they're doing. Not one. Nope. It's a big deal. They'll get the big building or a plaque on the wall and say, look at how great this person is because they've given us so much money. What a charitable guy. No charity whatsoever. No charity. You can give your goods and it doesn't mean you have charity. Do you give your body to be burned? What is your intent? Where is your heart? That is where the charity lies. It's in the heart. What is driving you to do things? We need to have charity. We need that heart to serve other people. That is what's going to get this church to grow. That is what is going to, you know, that's what it's all about. Reaching people. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Verse 5, doth not behave itself unseemly. Again, that's sanctification. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. That love of the truth. Not, not... Not iniquity, not reveling in your sin and oh, how great it is to go out and get drunk and get high and do all these things. That, no. Rejoicing not in iniquity, rejoice in the truth. Beareth all things. It's, it, you know, charity's long suffering. You're, you, you know, people, uh, and I'll tell you what, people in need, 
When people ha are in a place in their life where they're very needy, there's a lot of things going on, it might be easy for a person to get annoyed with that and get aggravated. Irrit oh man, this person's calling me again. What do they want now? That's not a charitable heart. Charity suffereth long. And you think about the things that you might need in your life. When you go to God in prayer and you're, God, help me out with this. God, this is going on in my life. God, my job's not working out. God, my marriage isn't working out. God, my kids aren't working out. All these things that might be going on. And you're going to God. What if God had an attitude of, it's Pastor Burson's again. What does he want now? All right. What, what is it? Can't you just deal with this on your own? Come on, I got a lot of things to do. Is that the way that we deal with people? I hope not, right? That's not very charitable if that's the way that you deal with people. Beareth all things, verse 7. Believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For when we see through a glass dark, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Verse 13, and now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. We need to have a charitable heart. Now, do we need to love the truth and, and not compromise and be on fire? Yes. Do we need to, to get ourselves sanctified and, and try to, to be a, a vessel that's meet for the master's use? Yes, we need to focus on that. Do we need to get more knowledge? Yes, we need to keep growing. But we need charity. Charity is the whole purpose behind it. Treating other people, you know, looking out and loving other people. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, if you love your neighbor, you're going to warn them that his house is on fire. You're going to warn him that he's in danger. That look, if you don't stop doing these things, something bad's going to happen. Or what, you know, uh, if you don't stop playing with matches, you're going to burn your house down. <laughs> right? You're going to get burned. But um, turn, if you would, to Matthew 28. Because this, this really boils down to, to what I want to what I think we need to be focused on and we have been focused on and this is the this is the main thing I think that's one of the main things that separates this church from every other church in Prescott Valley Matthew 28 the end of the chapter Jesus Christ's instruction unto the church his last instructions that he's given them in verse number 18 it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. It's a great commission. Now, this is an area, honestly, we need to work on. And I'm excited. There's, there's some new things I'm going to be introducing to our soul winning. I don't know if you notice this, but it bothers me every single week when we go through our announcements. Do the salvations bother me? No, not at all. But there's another number underneath the salvations that we keep track of. And right now we're in the month of October. And we have nobody baptized yet for the year. And that's a problem. Look, and I'll be the first, I'll take responsibility for that. But things are changing. Okay, we're going to be doing even more to reach people. And I, I, in the weeks to come, I'm going to explain a little bit more of what that's going to be. It involves the soul winning. The, the soul winning, look, people are getting saved. But we are failing in the Great Commission overall. Because when he says, go therefore and teach all nations... We need to teach them about Christ as we're doing that. We're going out and we're teaching them about Jesus Christ. But then what's the next part? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, it's not like we've never had anybody baptized, but so far for this year, we haven't. 
We're not fulfilling that, that, that task, that goal. We're doing something wrong. And I've identified some things in, in the way that I've taught people to go soul winning at the end and in, in, in dealing with people and following up through with people and, and, and just making sure that you make people a priority and really care. Look, you, first you should care enough about them to just give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. But continue to care for that person after they receive Christ. Look, that's not, don't just let them go. We need to be as much as possible. I mean, we're not going to be these, these just weirdos that like, leave me alone. <laughs> Stop bothering me. But, you know, as much as people will, are, are willing to, to keep the door open with us, we need to be pursuing and seeking them and trying to get them in church and trying to get them baptized and trying to get them to do what's right. And that's because the third part of that commission, after he says baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, is teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Then it becomes an aspect of, hey, God says do this. God says don't do this. God says, you know, and teaching them to observe all these things. They don't need to observe all those things before they're saved. They get saved first, get baptized. Now look, this is how you ought to be living your life and get them in and get them learning. That's the great commission. That's what we need to be going out and doing with people. It's more than just preaching the gospel. Look, if you haven't gone out and preached the gospel, start with step one. We need to go out there. But, but in so doing, we're going to be changing some of the, some of the methods that, that we've been doing to, get, to be more invested in people, to have more charity in people, to increase more and more. Now, look, if you were looking at our church and say, well, look, you, you, you do love the brethren. Look, we do. But we need to increase more and more. We need to keep pushing ourselves farther and farther into serving God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity we had to meet together. Dear Lord, I love being around this group. I love this church, dear Lord. It is truly amazing. The people here are wonderful, dear Lord, and we love you. And we want to serve you, dear God. Sometimes we fumble, sometimes we don't do things right. And we just pray that you would continue to guide us and instruct us and lead us the whole way, dear God. Help us to improve. We want to do more for you. We're not just satisfied with, with letting things be the way they are. We want to reach as many people as possible, dear Lord. Help us to do that. Help us to have the wisdom and the knowledge and stir up our spirits, dear Lord, that we would, would have a zeal and be zealous and repent of, of anything that, that, that's keeping us from, from serving you and doing more, dear Lord. Help us to be zealous and do the good works, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.